and we're live. Welcome everyone to another Juju Office Hours. This one's part of the Ubuntu Online Summit. What this is is we all grab a bunch of people from the Juju community. We have a little status meeting update for you. So if you want, you can just subscribe to the YouTube channel, find out what's going on in Juju land. Um, so we try to have these on a semi-regular basis so we can tell you not just what's happening with Juju and Core and the ecosystem and tools and stuff, but in the charms themselves and what people are working on and what workloads and solutions um, we plan on delivering as part um, as part of the release process for what we're working on here, all of these guys here, uh, over the next six months. So we're going to cover stuff from big data, for containers. Marco just got back from the OpenStack Summit where he did a talk on benchmarking that looked pretty good, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to talk about what's new. Juju 1.25 is out, so we should definitely cover... Uh, some of the things that are going there. I know planning for 126 and alpha and stuff is well underway. So we got a lot of stuff to cover. Who wants to go first? Nobody. So George is going to pick. So we had a few sessions yesterday. Uh, so either way, we're going to we're going to go through this. And I think I really want to say, um, you know, s sitting through Corey's talk and through the big data talk on where charms are going as far as making it really simple for people to write better charms, better testable charms, simpler charms, charms that are easier to understand. Um, it's no secret that I'm pretty much a fan of uh, the reactive framework and layers and charm building now, so we're building charms. So why don't we kick off the discussion first talking about that, where that's coming um, through, uh, where people can get docs, What's the state of the tooling around this feature? How many charms have we started to see with um, that are written this way? And just kind of let's talk about what this is probably the biggest, I think, good change that's going to be very fundamental throughout the uh, how people are writing charms. So what do you guys think so far? Well, obviously, I think it's great because I <laughs> did a lot more on it. But um, I just put the link in the uh, uh, UOS. Uh, IRC channel sure. to interfaces.juju solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we uh, are collecting the uh, set of interface layers and uh, base layers uh, mm -hmm. for people to, to use to build up their charms. Um, eventually, the plan for this is to have it be in the store, um, but for now, we've, we're running this sep as a separate service until we build up the um, the offering and and figure out how exactly best to integrate it with the store. Um, you can go there, you can click on the repository, and uh, most most of these should have decent uh, readme documentations. If they don't, then mm -hmm. file bugs, and we need to get those improved. Um, they should, the readme should, at a glance, explain, you know, how, how to use the layer, uh, what states the layer exposes, and everything like that. Um, so, yeah, that's mainly what I wanted to say. It's, I think it's a, a much easier way of kind of uh, writing charms that doesn't require you to, to redo all the boilerplate and, you know, re, you know have domain knowledge about things like, you know, how to set up Apache, how to set up Nginx, um, how to set up Node.js. You can kind of rely on somebody else who knows how to do that to, to do it in the best way and reuse that, that knowledge and just focus on what your charm is deploying. Sure, and if you're looking for Corey's video from yesterday, we did an entire walkthrough on how to write a charm this uh, this new way, and um, we've gone ahead and all the documentation now for uh, how to write your charm this way is live on the site, so that's jujucharms.com slash docs, um, and it's the heading is, I believe, still uh, how to build your first charm, how to generate your char first charm. Uh, we'll definitely follow up on that. So all that's good and going, and I know, Kev, you guys kind of mentioned that you were looking at really simplifying a lot of the big data charms. So why don't you give us a TLDR on what's going on in the big data world? Yeah, sure. Um, we brought this up at a, our yesterday uh, big data session. The TLDR is that uh, big data charms are pretty complex. The way they are currently written um, is with the services framework, which did a fantastic job of um, allowing services to interact with one another. In the big data ecosystem, you have oodles of services that all have to talk together. Um, they all depend on certain states, right? When some config has been made or when some relationship has been made, um, then you react to that. Um, and again, the services framework served us well to do that, but this reactive pattern and this layered approach is going to serve us even more. Um, Corey's already written a fantastic um, 
a couple of interface layers for us. You can look at on his the URL that he posted. Um, you'll see there's a plugin layer already and an HDFS layer. What this allows us to do is take um, a service like Spark, for example, um, that, that we actually want to use to, to do something with our data that's stored, and we can wait on certain states, right? So we, Spark shouldn't do anything until HDFS is ready. So rather than have that logic built into the Spark charm, we just say, look, man, tell me when HDFS is ready. Import that layer um, and, and go to work once it's ready. So it, it really is a much simpler way to say, look, my charm is providing a service. Here's the only bits that, that this service does. Um, so let's let's build on top of other things that, that set our foundation. So I really dig it. It's coming up in this cycle. We'll, we'll have all of our big data charms rewritten using this approach as I think it'll make maintenance a lot easier, um, the ability to push fixes at a, at a layer level much easier. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about it. So are you ready by the end of the cycle to be like, with layers, the big data team threw away X lines of code that yeah. we had to maintain? Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I don't know how much work that is. But I think it would be really interesting because I see some of the older charms, um, you know, not a knock against anybody, but, like, the IS charms that are, like, these huge Python-y things, and you're like, man, you can replace large chunks of this with a layer. Sure. Just in the stuff that we've done in containers has had that uh -huh. side effect already. Uh, we've been prototyping the, the runtime portion of the new Kubernetes charms. Uh -huh. is it just provides Docker and spins up some of the Docker accessories, and this is something that I never liked in our historical charming pattern, is I was forcing anybody that imported my libraries to then write their charm in Python, but with layers and the reactive pattern, I'm now setting states that they can subscribe to in Bash, and then they can deliver their application in Bash and, and run forward into the future, right? They don't have to maintain a Python charm that they didn't want to write in the first place. Because right. I've already delivered Docker, you've given you all the, the add-ons and benefits and also some states if you want to use Reactive to work on top of those. Uh, we've seen a reduction of, give or take, 230 lines in our charm already, just by removing the, Py the, the full Python charm and splitting it into layers. That's awesome. Okay, we'll get to you, Chuck, because I can tell you're ready to talk about Kubernetes. But, uh, Kev, anything else? Yeah, so I, I do. Um, this is a little bit, uh, this has nothing to do with big data, but in our last office hours, uh, we had just gone through a couple of charm reviews where we had two different ISVs, right, Azul Systems and IBM, that wanted to put up a Java runtime environment, which is really slick. Most of our, I guess it sort of ties into big data. We're, we're big users of Java, consumers of Java, and by default, we get the OpenJDK or OpenJR, OpenJDK JRE. Um, and that's, that's all well and good, but you've got this problem where all these charms are setting things in the environment. Java Home maybe goes in Bash RC. Some stuff goes in Etsy environment. And so it's kind of all over the place when people consume Java. What we're hoping to do um, is design a Java layer where uh, ISVs and people that want to provide a Java runtime environment can adhere to this layer build their charm on top, and then we can uh, let the consumers of Java, so Big Data, um, Tomcat, WebSphere, those guys, uh, people that want to use Java, can talk over this interface. Um, and what I wanted to share with you folks, and I'll put it in the uh, UOS channel, we've got a collaborative design going on um, <clears throat> where this is just a shared folder in Google Drive, and it shows, um, I, I think it's a good example of how uh, we're all coming together to make this layer um, the best it can be, right, to, to have some real value here. Uh, we've got some deployment drawings that are out there. We've got charm design considerations. What does it mean to provide a Java layer? Um, and so I would encourage anybody that's providing or writing new charms or maybe thinks that they have a, a core component that could be used by other folks to start with this kind of design. You know, draw it out. What's it look like when it's deployed? How does it connect to things? Um, and, and you can certainly share that with us. Um, Google Docs is great for that, and uh, and get our input on it. Um, I, I'm just really happy with the way the Java approach is going, how collaborative that it's been, and look forward to at the next Office Hour showing you uh, what the inter what the Java layer looks like and how people are using it to build Java charms. Yeah. So when you say sorry, I've got some questions. Mm -hmm. When you say Java layer, are you talking JRE slash JDK? Or are you talking like, for example, I would consider a Java layer just off the top of my head, give it a war file, generate stuff, right? Like, are you including, like, the middleware-ish kind of Tomcat-y things? No. Or, like, yeah. how would that work? Where, where would the middle, where would all the, you know, the Tomcats of the world yeah, live yeah. in that model? Right, so this layer literally uh, 
just puts the, the runtime environment down. There, there's potential to put the JDK down as well um, to make perhaps a, a Java development solution. That would be neat. Um, but this layer is more responsible for setting the environment to use uh, the, right, um, the right bits for Java. So as I mentioned before, um, I can't tell you how many Java charms we've seen where you're setting stuff in Etsy environment, then you're sourcing bash RC, and then you're, it's just all over the place. Um, so we, we really want this interface layer to be um, the gold standard for here's where we're putting Java home. Here's where Java C lives. Here's, you know, it handles all the update alternatives. It handles the package installation for the runtime itself. Um, and allows you to uh, uh, swap in, you know, maybe I want to try the open JDK, and then maybe I want to try Azul System Zulu 8. Um, you just swap that layer underneath Tomcat, and when it detects that a new uh, environment so is, is ready... So this is more consumed by those, by those yeah. tools as opposed to being a layer, right? Absolutely. It is, yep, it is the, the interface for Java that we want to uh, have folks standardized on. That's awesome. That, that's um, good to know. I know that there's a lot of... Uh, like even even between charms, figuring out how you're going to install Java is different depending on each charm, mm -hmm. right? Some, you know, and sometimes some Javas are not redistributable, and that makes it a little complicated, right? Yep. Um, I'd like to talk about this for a second, real quick, too. Um, so the I think the important aspect of this is to to kind of answer your question, George. Um, the okay, so the the J this Java interface is. Um, Essentially, a way to at runtime uh, enable the Juju, the uh, admin to swap out uh, JREs or JDKs um, to you know select the one that's that's best for their particular environment. Um, where the Tomcat uh, type thing would come in is if if your charm needs something like Tomcat uh, in order to to run your web application, that would be a base or runtime layer that will get built into your charm at build time. Um, so then you would, if you could then support both. You would have your charm built on top of Tomcat, uh, the Tomcat runtime layer, um, to deploy your web app. And then at, at runtime, you would connect that up with one of the swappable JREs or JDKs to actually um, run that using the JRE that is tuned specifically for the environment that you're deployed on. Okay, so definitely I think something we should talk about there is interface layers and runtime layers, right? You sort of define that in the JavaScript. Can you give me a general general definition of what's an interface layer? Obviously, something that's listed on interfaces.juju.solutions, but what's the difference between that and a runtime layer? And Just give us some examples. Sure. So um, the idea of runtime layers is they are the uh, kind of application runtime that your uh, charm uses to uh, make it easier to deploy your... Um, your uh, particular workload. So, uh, for instance, uh, the Tomcat uh, would be one to deploy uh, Java web apps uh, as WARS. Um, we have an Apache PHP layer for deploying, um, you know, PHP app web applications. You might have there's a Node.js one for deploying, you know, Node.js based applications. So it provides the um, it provides the setup uh, and um, and an organization of the of the bit that's going to you know run your particular uh, contained web application um, for uh, the interface uh, layers. That is interface layers are are kind of in a sense more more general. Their uh, interface layers are the layers that encapsulate the communication between uh, over a relation. So if you can kind of think of uh, Runtime layers is what charms are built on, and then uh, interface layers are what relations are built on. Um, so, uh, so interface layers are cross unit, cross machine, right. distributed, right? Whereas a runtime layer is something that happens on that unit machine, whatever term. Right, and in yeah. in the case of the Java um, interface layer, it's it's a little bit com um, confusing because we're talking about. Um, we're talking about a, a JDK or JRE relation. Um, it's a subordinate relation in this case that uh, allows you to um, take, uh, you know, multiple one of, one of a set of different Java charms that provide different JREs um, and connect those up as subordinate charms, and um, those provide a specific uh, Java JRE that will then be used to run 
the runtime, which then runs the uh, workload. Um, but the reason that we uh, are using interface uh, layers for the for the Java part is because it controls the communication um, between the the separate Java um, JRE charms and the charm that is uh, running the workload, which is built on a uh, runtime layer. Yeah, so that's really good also because I noticed that in the documentation we kind of just refer to layers kind of generically. I'm just kind of thinking out loud that maybe slash doc slash layers should exist or, or something that kind of makes that more... Well, we do we do spe- specifically call out um, interface layers. Like, if you go yeah. to interfaces.juju.solutions, there is a separate section for interface layers versus right. uh, other layers um, because they are different than the layers that charms are built on. So th- there's really, if you think about it, ki- kind of like three types of layers, uh, which I talk about in my blog post, which I should totally link. Hold on one second. Yep. Um, but uh, so, no, that's not the right one, big data. Um, so there's really three types of layers. Um, there are uh, ch- runtime layers that charms are built on. There are charm layers, which is the... Um, the, so ch- runtime layers are ge- uh, general, generic, um, and so they're they're intended to be used from multiple um, multiple different charms to kind of to build up from that. Whereas mm-hmm. charm layers are the specific uh, you know this this charm is implementation that's built on runtime layers and uh, interface layers, and then the interface layers uh, encapsulate uh, a given interface protocol. Uh, used to relate to other services. So there's there's three types, and I, I go into more detail on each type uh, in that blog post that I just linked to in uh, the IRC channel. Um, I, I don't want to rehash that entire post, but it, it, mm-hmm. it gives detail about what the difference is between the three three types. And there's a lot of overlap between the um, you know base runtime layer and the charm layer, but interface layers are are significantly more different. Yeah, so when I look at interfaces.juju.solutions, that, just looking at the two lists, that makes much sense. I was just talking from kind of a more holistic on the docs themselves. I'm just going to take an item. feels like yeah. we're bearing layers. Yeah, one thing I want to uh, clarify is that interfaces.juju.solutions, um, the, the, obviously there's interface layers. They have their section. Then there's the layers section. That really is intended to, to host the... Um, you know, base or runtime layers. Charm layers are really, um, you know, individual things that are not not generally going to be reused right. um, outside of that specific building that specific one charm. Yeah, I love that. Only two days later, after tricking Adam Stokes into doing an nginx base layer, that it's already there. Like that wasn't there a few days ago when I was trying to con him into doing that. So that's really awesome. Oh, one, one more thing I just want to throw out. Um, interfaces.juju.solutions, um, all you, the only thing that you need to add uh, a layer, a base layer or an interface layer to that is a Launchpad uh, login. You can log in with Launchpad and uh, contribute. So we're definitely uh, soliciting contributions to, to that. Yeah, so actually the freshest one that I noticed just a few a few days ago that originally had me talk to Adam was that we have a node node layer now as well. So those of you out there, if you're interested in, we've got, uh, you just go to interfaces.solutions. We still definitely need uh, base layers for common things that people might build charms around. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, we'd be more than happy to help you out with that. And of course, if you go to developer.juju.solutions, we'd be happy to pay for your cloud cloud bill and give you cred so that you can test all that stuff. Definitely um, don't pay out of your own pocket for that because you got us for that. All right, Any, anything else on layers? Man, that took a while. I didn't mean to start such an awesome conversation, but yeah, I think it's worth it because, um, like I said, I'm not saying I'm embarrassed of our previous term story, but I never want to hear about it again. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> All right, and with that, who's up? Chuck. I know Chuck wants to talk Docker, Kubernetes. What do you give? What do you give? What are you giving my users of Kubernetes this cycle? This has actually been a really good cycle for just consumers of Docker as a whole yeah. for delivering application containers. We've built a, a runtime layer, and we're starting to flesh out an API so that we get a natural DSL for doing common things in there, like Docker you know, Docker run, uh, Docker compose up, things like that. And these are properties are all being shared across both Docker Swarm 
as well as Kubernetes, uh, which are our two container orchestrators that we have uh, for the application container side of things. All that's getting delivered this cycle. You should start to see some of that surface in the charm store, especially in namespaces, uh, give or take by the end of the month. So it's going to be a huge release month for us. Uh, Docker 1.1 is on its way. Uh, we're gonna we're tracking that. We changed up the entire delivery mechanism. Whereas before we were shipping uh, bins on host, we're now delivering that via their upstream hypercube images, which is what they have moved to recommending. Um, we're also retooling a lot of the tooling layers around it. Uh, Flannel is getting some love and, and changed in a major update. We're shipping uh, two revisions behind right now, so it's not huge, but uh, a, a lot of love in that entire ecosystem right now with our efforts. Uh, on top of that. We're also documenting the whole process and, and getting everything ready to rock for anybody to consume. Just pull up a web page and, and start reading through how to get started. OK, awesome. Is there anything else container-wise? Um, I'm sure there's more, but it's escaping me at the moment. So maybe I'll okay. pipe up, pipe up again later. That's a, yeah, when you think of it, just interrupt Marco. That'll be good. OK. Before we move on, I really want to hear about the benchmarking talk at ODS and the people that you talked to about doing awesome benchmarky things. But let's also get some actual uh, boringness out of the way, and I mean boring in a good way. New version of Juju 125, new stable release. Um, Marco, can you kind of walk us through the latest features, fixes, goodness um, that we are now getting in, in 125? Yeah, following hot on the heels of 124, there's a 125 release. Uh, this adds improved networking features for AWS, which are, again, still experimental. Uh, but you now have a Juju space and Juju subnet command. Uh, this will allow you to do segmenting of uh, networking within a deployed environment from Juju. Uh, it currently only works on AWS. Uh, will soon be available for all other clouds that have that ability to, to do subnetting and networking. Um, that's why it's still experimental. Uh, we also have support for uh, storage on GCE and Azure, in addition to the existing uh, AWS, which is really exciting. Storage is back out from underneath a, a feature flag. It's been improved and revamped. 124 was put back behind one. Now it's available again. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's GA for the most part now. Uh, so if you, have a, if you have a charm that requires block storage, uh, or any kind of storage that needs to be modeled in the charm, you should just look to start adding that. It's all outlined in documents uh, and documentation under uh, charm author section. Um, finally, we have uh, payload management, which is a pretty exciting feature for tracking what charms are spinning up behind the scenes. Uh, specifically, things like if your if your charm installs a payload that is a KVM guest or a Docker container, for instance, uh, mm. so all your charm does is consume all the awesome work that uh, Chuck and Matt have been doing around the Docker ecosystem and just spin up a couple containers real easily. You can also register that payload in Juju uh, so that Juju will show you, hey, not only is it just charm, but it also has this payload running behind it. Uh, so it gives you better observability into your stack. Um, I want to throw a little extra in there, Marco, that it's Please. also a separate command. It doesn't actually show up whenever you run Juju status. You don't see those payloads. There's a secondary command for Juju list attack payloads. And that gives you an overview of just what payloads are running in your environment. It also tells you which unit it's on and what service group it's part of. What's nice about that is that if you're looking to migrate, say that you spun up a Kubernetes cluster, there's been a major release, there's some backward incompatible changes, you spin up your Kubernetes cluster and you start looking at your workloads and just migrate. It's, it makes it super simple for you to know exactly what's running in your environment at uh, the touch of the list payloads. Uh, the docs say to run Juju help payloads. For more information, you can also just go to the docs. I believe there's a whole document page on it as well. Uh, the final big notable release change, other than a, uh, a more bug fixes, are uh, support for devices in MAS 1.8 and above. Uh, so this is still behind a feature flag. You'll need to enable it with address allocation feature flag. There's been some conversation on the mailing list about this feature. It's pretty exciting. Uh, this will allow you to, in MAS, once putting up Lexi containers, to have the IP addresses for those containers registered in MAS, and those containers registered as devices in MAS. So much like payload management gives you the observability that uh, what payloads you have running on units, in MAS you'll be able to see what containers have been spun up and what units they're attached to and running under, all within your MAS UI. Uh, this will be improved, again, from user experience in MAS in 1.9, but for now, it exists as devices in 1.8, which is pretty exciting to see, is a lot of people that are using MAS are deploying uh, lots of complex density 
uh, model workloads, things like OpenStack and Big Data and stuff. And so being able to see where your machines are uh, in that machine management service that Maz provides is pretty awesome. Uh, and I think that's it. Otherwise, it's just a, a list of bugs. You can go to jujucharms.com slash docs. Uh, under the reference section, we have the release notes for all releases of Juju to see this information and more, as well as the rest of our documentation there. Yeah. My favorite pet bug is Juju finally will return large integers instead of scientific notation when using config get, which... And action get. Any... <laughs> Yeah. Anything that uses uh, that uses big integers in YAML will finally be fixed. Yeah, that, which is fun to see. I love those bugs so much that I just have to call them out because they're really great. Um, I also want to point out that uh, Maddie Williams uh, a few days ago did a video on how do you can model network partitions with Juju, um, and that is a video that he captured there. So if you're on the Juju channel, uh, the related videos below, you should be able to find those, or they're here or here somewhere. Um, but they're here in this channel. Um, again, that's Maddie Williams. The name of the video is Modeling Network Partitions in Juju. Uh, definitely high detail stuff that uh, you could check out. Okay, so awesome new client release. That's really great. Obviously, these um, binaries are all in the PPA. Um, we have binaries for OS X and Windows as well. And does this say CentOS? Is that, is that right? Yeah, CentOS. Sorry, you cut out. My question was, do we have RPMs for this? Did I cut out, or is that just Marco? I think it's just Marco. Oh, that is. So it's not an RPM, but there is a CentOS tarball there um, that I see. So it would be really great if uh, those of you out there using CentOS, I think it would be really great to get RPMs built out of those and pushed wherever they need to go to be part of CentOS itself. Um, but I didn't know we were pushing out tarballs. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, sorry. The CentOS stuff is, it's a, uh, you have to extract and do an install and it's on an RPM. Right? Yeah, yeah, I see that. I, and I was just saying if someone out there wants to help us out, make our real proper RPMs out of those and help us uh, get the process of getting that in the CentOS and Fedora and whatnot, that would be incredible. All right, and with that, what, uh, okay, so the client stuff's out of the way. That's really good. Um, that's on a nice pulse there. So we, we will have probably, what, one or two more releases before 16.04 LTS of Juju, something like that. Um, Marco, you just came back from the OpenStack Summit, which is really awesome, in Tokyo. You obviously had a good time. Um, we will be linking to his video, uh, which is on the OpenStack uh, YouTube channel, which is linked from the UU channel, so it should be on this side of the video, I believe. You should see an OpenStack logo. If you click through there, you'll see all of the videos uh, from the OpenStack Summit that I've been watching on uh, myself. Um, you'll see plenty of uh, talks of us deploying OpenStack of Juju. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth talking about the future of Juju. Uh, us demoing a bunch of stuff um, as far as things that we do. Uh, Juju with OpenStack, which is which is really awesome. There's a plethora of talks there from Tokyo. Um, the OpenStack Foundation does record every session and make them available to everyone, so that's really awesome. So I highly recommend you check it out. But Marco, you had one of my favorite sessions. You talked about benchmarking. So um, if you can kind of talk a little bit that there's something new and different that you might have or might not have announced um, during your talk during OpenStack. Uh, yeah, so we've created a tool internally that we've been using for a little while, um, which allows for some pretty in-depth benchmarking. Uh, allows you to execute a benchmark uh, through Juju, much like you've been able to today. We've been talking about benchmarking in the public for a while by using Juju Actions. This is much like the Juju GUI is for the command line of Juju. This is the a benchmark UI for benchmarking, but it also adds the ability to track and, and monitor different um, facets of data that you normally would be interested in when benchmarking. So before, you run a benchmark, you get back a number. Uh, with this tool that we're releasing called Benchmark GUI, which we open sourcing very soon, just a few more little bugs to wrap up. Um, it's a UI that allows you to execute benchmarks, but also see the machines and profiles of the machines you were running on. So what was the hardware like? What was the constraints like? What was the size of the instances you were running on? as well as the entire configuration of the workload you were stressing. So if you were doing something like Siege against a web stack with a web head and a caching layer and a database, or if you were 
doing a terror sword against a, a Hadoop deployment or rally against OpenStack or any real benchmark. It shows you the deployment you were, you were benchmarking, number of units, how they were dispersed out, how they were related to each other. And it also collects metrics, the ability to see what the machine was doing or all the machines that were involved in the benchmark were doing at the time of the benchmark and the ability to graph that data. Uh, so with this benchmark, you can do all of that plus do a comparison across multiple runs. So you can make a run one day and run the other day and do a comparison to see what may have changed, different package versions installed, different workloads. Uh, so we demoed this. The video, George, will include somewhere uh, in this summary. Um, in addition to lots of other good talks that were going on, both from Canonical and otherwise, the OpenStack Summit was an exciting one to go to this year. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of really interesting things going on. It's interesting to see what people are doing with their clouds once they've built them and the problems they're solving. Uh, but benchmarking seems to be a common thread across all kinds of different topics, whether you're talking about actually deploying and managing a cloud or putting workloads on top of clouds or putting workloads on bare metal. Performance seems to be a thing that kind of creeps in everywhere. So it's nice to see that with the Juju model, you can actually exercise and validate your assumptions and your um, and your deployments by just doing a couple of extra commands that already exist on top of Juju. Right, and benchmarking is pretty much dedicated Juju action specifically for testing performance, right? Um, well, it's a way that you can repeatedly and reliably execute a load generator against a stack of services. Um, so the repeatability is the key thing when you're doing benchmarking because you've got to be able to assure that when you stand up this deployment again, whether it's tomorrow or the next year or 10 years from now, it has to stand up in, in, as close to possible the same way it was previously in order to have results that would matter for any kind of comparison. And so using the model that Juju provides, you can do that, plus it gives you the framework that you can execute these uh, these benchmarks. And if anyone's run benchmarks for more than one tool, the, the data formats are all crazy. It's, it's impossible to run one tool and another tool and have the formats come back in a sane way that a single system can grok. Uh, with Juju, you have the ability to abstract all that using the idea of encapsulation of action so that results come back in a very standard, um, processable format that both a human can read as well as a machine, which makes it an invaluable tool for people who have large scale out complex workloads or even relatively small workloads. Um, the ability to do those benchmarkings of all different components you have deployed as well as benchmarking the entire solution. Uh, it's it really solves a pretty hard problem to crack in today's world of scale out cloud architectures. Right, because it's not so complex anymore, especially on the cloud. Yeah. I don't even know what machine I'm on, I don't have control of the hypervisor, how am I supposed to test this stuff, right? So this gives you a nice way to to do that stuff. So I'm sure Tokyo, going to Tokyo was like a really tough thing for you to do. Good good to know you soldiered through. <laughs> well, 13 hour plane ride definitely definitely didn't uh, make it any easier. Oh man, that sounds horrible. I'm glad you went though. That's really <laughs> good. <laughs> all right, so with that, we're about ready to um, wrap up over the next few weeks here. So first of all, welcome. Also, I should have started with this. Welcome to the brand new shiny U U uh, Juju YouTube channel. Uh, what we're going to do is currently uh, the way things are designed is is I'm gathering all of the videos from all of us that we've been publishing to our personal channels and kind of putting it in into one branded channel that you can subscribe to um, that way on your mobile device or whatever you can just subscribe to Juju and then when you get an office hours or we decide to do a demo you just get like a notification um, it's actually surprisingly hard to consolidate people's videos when you have independent you personal YouTube channels because YouTube doesn't have a method to move videos and stuff. So we're going to, I'm going to try to, I know a lot of you have been subscribing to my personal channel to get a lot of, of YouTube um, information. So we're going to make that nice, tight and clean for you guys. And we'll also be integrating these videos more directly into the website now as well. Uh, if you haven't noticed, if you go to ggterms.com, the design team has also launched the new website, which looks really brilliant. And there are circles involved instead of squircles, and everyone's really excited about that. So with that, um, le let's just do a quick uh, around the room here. Uh, Chuck, you got anything else to just tell anybody? Not this week, no. Everything's going well, so make sure you keep your eyes posted to the list to see our newest releases. We'll be announcing those as well. Awesome. Corey? Um, no, just, well, uh, check out the interfaces at Solutions. Uh, 
see if, you, if there are any things that you can add and contribute. Awesome. Kevs? I have nothing more to add. <laughs> Marco? I also have nothing more to add. Great. And I've been George Castro. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. We will see you guys in a few weeks. I owe you all a schedule for the new iteration of Juju Office Hours The Cycle uh, because I've been failing at that. So with that, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good time, and thanks for using our stuff. We dig it.